Thank you. With that, we'll start this content. The first question is, the county has a huge unfunded pension liability per grand jury. What is your opinion on that? Did you say me? The county has no, a... No, is it for me? The question for yes, me. Yes, ma'am, please. Uh, the county does have a, a huge pension liability, $345 million, I believe is what it is, uh, and it, it's unsustainable. The county has made assumptions on growth rates that I believe are unsustainable. Nobody gets a 7 to 10% return nowadays, so I think it needs to be relooked at and revamped because we, we will go bankrupt at this rate. And this is not a problem that's indigenous just to this this county or this city, counties are going bankrupt all over California because they aren't attacking their unsustainable pension problems. I think it needs to be looked at, areas where we can fund it each year, and it shouldn't be put off in a separate category by itself uh, and ignored, and then said we balance the budget in the county, which is what this county does. Thank you. Ms. Ray. Well, this is, uh, uh, as she said, it, an issue all the way across the board. It's not just with this county. But I'll tell you what this county and this board is specifically doing about this problem. First of all, we have our first budget surplus in many years. And at the insistence of both myself and Supervisor Meacham, we have made sure that those budget surpluses, which are one-term are one -term monies, get applied to our reserves and our unfunded liability uh, category. So we're beginning to rebuild back these funds. In addition, we've also begun a, a really interesting new program where we're pre-funding our pension fund, which is going to save taxpayers over a million dollars a year just by being ahead on our payments. This is another example of why this board needs to stay in the way it is. It is absolutely being run in a fiscally conservative and responsible manner to make sure that we're protected as taxpayers well into the future. Thank you. You say, well, sir, we do this time. Do you support or oppose DOS Rule 1001, and what are your reasons? Oh, sorry, that's getting me there. Uh, rule 1001. Uh, rule 1001, the dust rule, is a very controversial rule that was voted in by my predecessor, Paul Teixeira, and when I was pledging what I was going to do before I took this office, I said that I would not undo what Supervisor Teixeira had, had done. He made a very difficult decision. I also am behind Rule 1001, and what Rule 1001 does is it requires state parks to mitigate for its portion of the particles that come off the dunes and essentially onto the mesa. I do support doing or using Rule 1001 going forward. Also, State Parks has now finally agreed with us. Just two weeks ago at our APCD meeting, we came up with our consent decree, which is in its second iteration now, where State Parks is in agreement with us that they will begin true mitigation. So we're finally going to be moving forward in this and hopefully seeing some very real response and being able to protect our people's air and our, our quality of life here. None of that is significantly impacting the dunes themselves or the riders. And so it's important to also recognize that that's part of kind of a cadre of things that we can put together that the county can also help with its mitigations so that we make sure that the riding area stays open, our economic value of that riding area is still preserved, but at the same time, so too is our air quality. Thank you, Ms. Uh, the dust rule is a very controversial rule. It was implemented by a one vote majority from the APCD, the Air Pollution Control District. Um, it is an agreement basically to lessen what they call particle number 10, which is sand and dust blowing off from a specific area of the dunes where they ride ATVs. Um, it's law right now, so there's when you, when you agree to be a supervisor, you agree to follow the law. There's nothing that a supervisor can do right now to change that law. There is a lawsuit right now with Friends of the Dunes, and they object to this rule, and that lawsuit hasn't played out yet, but I don't foresee any changes with that. The goal of dust, the dust rule, Rule 1001, was to lessen the dust coming off of the dunes in that area and improve the health of the people that live in that area that are close to it. So if you believe the science behind the formulation of the dust rule and the consent decree, which was an agreement between the two groups in how to work that out uh, with uh, CARB involved in the process, then my question to my opponent is, why would you approve a subdivision, Cypress Ridge 2, to be built in an area that's part of that area considered 
impacted by the plume, why would you make a motion in front of the Board of Supervisors to approve that if you feel dust is an issue in that area? If dust is, is an issue in that area and it's impacting people's breathing, you're, you're looking at a subdivision right in the, center, in the center of that area. Is it because you received a $2,000 contribution from the builder? That's my question. Thank you. Let, let, let's, let's try our best to, to maintain and move forward. Any questions as well? One candidate to the other. Uh, I, I, I want to ask you that you respond to it during your closing remarks. Thank you. With that, this question goes to Ms. Compton. What is your position on the Phillips 66 Railsburg project? The Phillips 66 Railsburg project is a project on the um, Nipomo Mesa. It is for the extension of a rail spur to allow, allow Phillips to bring in rail from uh, oil, crude oil, from different sources by rail. Prior to this time, they had brought it in by different method, methodology. They have petitioned to um, build a rail spur to bring in five different uh, loads of rail five times a week, 80 car loads of, uh, of oil uh, five times a week. Uh, it's a controversial project. It's a project that probably won't create a whole lot of jobs. Um, the project is going through, and, and I was just called on my way here this morning that I guess the EIR, the revised EIR, was just posted on the website, so I'll be spending the weekend looking at that. Um, there are a lot of concerns with people. It was opened up after the first round at an EIR. It's in the revised, finishing the revised period, and there were about 500 comments by concerned citizens, mostly by those that live there. Their concerns um, surrounded the noise, the pollution, um, the possibility of an accident, could occur, um, but I think the the question that applies and that I ask to people who are opposed to this rail spur is, if you think the rail spur isn't going to go through, do you realize that rail is already being brought through this county by rail? And that um, degree has increased by about 400% over the last couple of years. So as a prudent um, candidate running for supervisor, until I have all the facts, I can't make a determination on uh, going forward with the project or not. Well, we all know that there are serious impacts to be mitigated, and that's the purpose of an EIR. So I, too, got notified that that, that EIR dropped this morning. Of, uh, clearly, I was a little busy this morning, so I'm looking forward to reading through that as well. And one of the issues that we have to deal with is the cumulative impacts, and that's the part that we really have to take a look at, and that's the part for why it was recirculated in the first place. So some of those impacts are more than just the impacts to the neighboring development. They're also economic impacts, both good and bad. So we have to be able to, to weigh out what those impacts are. For example, there's future commercial development at Trilogy that will have to interface with this project. I want to make sure the EIR is taking a look at that. And what, is that what does that look like for jobs? What does that look like for the uh, relationship between the two? We have an increased intensity of use. We have emergency preparation that we've got to deal with, including emergency preparation funding over decision making that we don't make here in the County of San Luis Obispo. This is where my attention has really been in the last six months, is making sure that our local taxpayers don't get stuck with a bill for the rail that Ms. Compton is talking about, but we don't have decisions over what she was just talking about. She's absolutely right. But we do have fiscal impacts. So I've been up in Sacramento arguing for our taxpayers to make sure that we're protected there. This is a very complex issue. It's not jobs versus the environment. It's about impacts to not only our area, but surrounding area as well. I look forward to looking through that EIR, and I'll be hosting something in November as a study Thank session. Thank you, Ms. Ray. Ray, this question will start with you. Do you think there should be a moratorium on building due to lack of water in the Mesa and the Pomo? At this time, I don't think we're ready for a moratorium on building. And the reason why is because you really have to be able to prove from a legal point of view why nobody should be able to build. What we're doing with an LOS 3 or a level of severity 3 basin is we're asking for a one-to-one -one offset. So, for example, many of you uh, who live on the Mesa know that Black Lake has a uh, expansion project that is making its way through the pre-application process. And you might ask yourself, how on earth are they going to be able to build that? But what they're doing is they're proposing to pull out golf courses, which literally drink water right out of our basin, and change the use, which will actually potentially either be water neutral or water negative. 
So when we look at those projects, moratorium is not the appropriate thing. We have to look at, at projects based on their water use, and that's what I would be uh, in favor of going forward. Thank you, Ms. Compton. Well, water is an issue on the Napomo Mesa. When we moved into Napomo 20 years ago, people were hauling water in. It's a concern. In Napomo, we're dependent on the groundwater. We're not dependent on other sources. We're dependent on the groundwater or what is being brought up by pipeline due to the fact that we have an adjudicated basin now in that area. Uh, I do think before new subdivisions go in, you should have infrastructure. Infrastructure includes water, things like that. So I'm not um, in favor of unregulated growth going on in South County. I think you need some of the infrastructure there, but I think it's been years and years before we've done anything about the water, and I think that's a concern to me. Um, when you look at one-to-one -one offsets, I guess my thought is, has there been an economic analysis done of one-to-one -one offsets? You're affecting businesses, you're affecting future development, and I think a lot of times the county planning department doesn't look at the economic impacts of the decisions that they make. They're looking at this up north in the Paso area too. There was talk at one time of a two-to-one offset, and one-to-one uh, uh, -one is not unreasonable in, in certain situations, but I think you have to look at it financially too. Not just local economic impacts, but what you're doing to the economy, what you're doing to the local county, and what you're doing to jobs. Thank you. Ms. Captain, this question is, we'll start with you. What are your feelings about the was now or this was on a water range project? For those of you that are unaware, in Wasna, the Porter family has proposed um, opening up a well for exp exploration. It's a well that was um, put in place about 20 years ago. They would like to explore the option. They have the mineral rights on the property. How I approach different um, questions regarding oil or private property rights is I am a firm believer that if you are living on the land, you own that land, you have a right to um, have your case heard and um, petition the county to listen to your arguments, pro and con, on such a subject. Uh, right now, they have applied for a minor use permit, which is usually a pretty simple process as a staff level response. I don't think this will be a simple process. I think this will go through a, a more detailed environmental impact report. Um, whether there's a negative declaration, I can't predict into the future what will happen with that. But I believe that it shouldn't be prejudged. These people own the mineral rights to their property and they, they should have the opportunity to lay out their case and the pros and cons uh, heard about that. I do realize the concerns of the people out there. We ranch out there. There are concerns about uh, the environment, about the future of opening that whole area up. And I have heard those people loud and clear. But um, until it goes through the process and you listen to all the comments and all the input and you hear what the county has to say, again, you're prejudging a project. And I think the owner of that property has the right to have his case heard. Thank you. That's right. Well, every project before us is being heard and going through the process. So that's a given. So the question is, what are, the, what are your personal uh, filters? through which you're going to look and make those decisions. And I think that that's what the person who's asking the question wants to know. So a couple of things with regard to the Phillips, or excuse me, the uh, Porter Ranch project. For me, I want to make sure that I am looking at what those future impacts are. And those impacts can be in real time impacts or according to um, the CEQA process, we can be looking at cumulative or expected impacts from this. So I will be looking at those. And specifically what I want to know has to do around water usage. And this is critical. So that will be one thing that I base my decision on is water, in, water usage. Secondly, I would base my decision on any impacts to the Wasna Valley. Wasna Valley has been quite clear about what they want. And so I don't know yet whether or not that project will have any impacts there, but it, we've, again, been clear that that's not something that we want to see. Um, thirdly, we have uh, general plan impacts. Um, we have uh, other just basic land use impacts. And so as that goes through the process, the question right now will be whether or not it can mitigate for all of those things. And so in my decision making, that will be what I'm basing my decision making on. I hope that helps uh, clarify that for you. Thank you. Next question, we'll start with you, Ms. Ray. What would you do to create jobs or grow the local economy? I like that because I can put that in the present term. Um, and having served on the Economic Vitality Corporation for four years, this is something that is that not only do I promise to do, but I have been doing. And you can take a look at a look at two pretty big ones in San Luis. 
uh, near uh, South Higuera area, or Broad, excuse me, South Broad Street, Mind Body and Digital West. These are two beautiful examples of what job creation can look like in this county where we're creating hundreds of jobs. Our solar farms in the North County is another example of creating literally over a thousand jobs. So we've got some very forward thinking business people in this county. Now how I can support that is not only helping them expedite their processes, helping them get through the county paperwork, but also creating a, 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 an environment that allows for businesses to be able to come, especially those who create head of household jobs. So that would include things like fiber optic um, projects around the uh, county. That also includes workforce housing. The number one thing we heard at EVC when we surveyed those high-level companies was they can't come to San Luis because their workers can't find housing that they can afford. If we as the county can find a way to provide that housing, the businesses will come and everybody wins. Thank you. Ms. Compton? I would look at and evaluate the whole process of what's going on with the county. Permit fees. Are permit fees too high? Are they out of control? I would encourage businesses to come to this town. In California, we're losing businesses, not attracting businesses. I would look at the airport, and this is something the EBC is currently doing, looking at the airport. It's very hard to get in and out of San Luis Obispo. If you're a business person, you have to go to LA or San Francisco. I would stop penalizing small businesses when they contribute three quarters to the economy of this county um, and stop penalizing them with, with fees and regulations. I would not look at increasing sales taxes in the unincorporated areas. There are very few businesses already in the unincorporated areas. For example, in the Pomo, why in the heck would we want to increase sales taxes on those small businesses that are already hurting? Uh, if you want to discuss workforce housing, I agree there's a lack of workforce housing. Workforce housing is defined as the median income of San Luis Obispo, about 60%. It's 120 to 160% of that median family income. It could mean a person making $94,000 qualifies for workforce housing. When I look at housing and bringing people here, I think there's a lot of different things that need to be done. When you look at San Luis Obispo, only 4% of the county is developed or going to be developed. So we're not an overcrowded, overpopulated county. And when you look at what's zoned for workforce housing and for people with affordable, regular jobs, it's just not there. I think you have to look at opening up the zoning and making it an economy of scale for a builder to want to build. We can't give builders piecemeal five acres here to build and say build an affordable house. They need to be able to afford, they need to be able to build larger areas where they have economies of scale and it's more affordable for them. Thank you. What's up with Ms. Compton? Do you understand why when you lower the threshold to what in taxes from two third to fifty five percent that it weakens Proposition 13? Yes, I understand that. Um, when a board of supervisors lowers the threshold, this is part of Prop 13, which a lot of people don't understand. A lot of people think Prop 13 just has to do with uh, protecting the tax increases on your house. When the Howard Jarvis Association um, developed Prop 13, they knew that taxes would be less coming into the government coffers. So they added making it more difficult for that government to raise taxes. So they put a super majority in there. So to raise special taxes in counties included, under Section 3 of Prop 13, it says you need a super majority, two-thirds rather than 55%. Doesn't only have to do with your house value. Uh, when you lower that threshold, you make it easier to raise taxes. It's already been done. Um, by educators, if you recall a couple of years ago, I forget the prop number, but they lowered it so it's easier. It's only 55% for educational bonds. I don't want to make it easier for our government to raise taxes on small businesses and people. I prefer the two-thirds majority rather than the 55% majority, and I think my opponent and I have philosophical differences about that. I have no problem if you make the arguments on the other side, but don't make the argument that you're for Prop 13 when you vote on a legislative platform to lower that threshold from two-thirds to 55%. I just, it's disingenuous in my opinion. Thank, thank you. Please, hey, you please hold on to your class. We will do that at the end and we'll, we'll share the energy, but for the sake of moving it forward, I would appreciate your patience. Ms. Ray. Let's explain a couple things here of what the board is trying to get done. What the board is trying to get done is find some way to be able to repair our crumbling roads. And we all know 
that when you neglect roads, over time they become exponentially more expensive to take care of. Just take a look at how you got here today. There's a tremendous difference between the roads in Arroyo Grande and the roads in Grover Beach. The roads in Arroyo Grande are being funded. Our pavement management plan is being funded by our half-cent sales tax. Grover Beach has been unable to keep up with their roads problems, and Grover Beach is now floating a $48 million bond that is going to fall onto taxpayers. So philosophically speaking, the use of sales tax to be able to, um, to pay for roads is a way for us to protect property owners on an individual way. And so that is the purpose for what we're asking for. And this board has asked for this for well over 10 years. This is not something new for this agenda. And in 2010, Etta Waterfield tried the same argument against Kacha. And now, that argument failed because our voters saw through that as a red herring. We need to be talking about things that we do on a daily basis here in the county and make sure that we don't keep our eye off the ball. Thank you. Please, ladies and gentlemen, if you, if you please, would you please hold on to your excitement until we're done? <laughs> Otherwise, we'll be here longer than we plan on. And I appreciate it. Both ladies appreciate your encouragement. You're here. You're being here inspires us all. So let's allow us to move forward, and we'll give you a chance at the end to, to show your power. With Ms. Ray, do you support the urgency ordinance to protect the Casarola's water supply? Absolutely. It was critical. It was one of the first votes I took as supervisor. It was mine that was deciding vote because it needed a four-fifths majority. We have a crisis, not only in Paso Robles, but countywide. And so, yes, absolutely, not only did I support the urgency ordinance, which expires this August, but I and four other supervisors are doing everything we can to get the tools in place to be able to allow management of that water source. Right now, it is the wild, wild west up there, and we have to make sure that we protect that water source. In addition, we have to make sure that the protection of that water source is not in the hands of the Board of Supervisors. And that's something that I worked hard at, at as supervisor. Um, so our roads are really bad, especially in South County. We need to do something with that and, and correct that. I don't think the way to do it is to add an additional tax on us. When this Board of Supervisors had the chance to vote for prioritizing our roads and putting them higher up on the list, they chose not to. I think you need to do that. I think you need to put it higher up on the list so more money can go to that. Do I think it should be all paid off in one year? No. Do I think if you put it off in the future, it's going to be worse, worse and more expensive? Of course I do. I also see the, the um, tendency to lower the degree of harshness with regard to the road. So whereas a road might get a... Uh, 50 score, meaning it's just mediocre, they're changing that bar. And I don't think that's fair to do. They are what they are. So I think they need to prioritize roads, which hasn't been done, and then more funding can go through, through to roads. I also don't think it's something you do in one year. You put maybe 30% aside in future years and target it for roads. It's not just roads that are bad in this county. We have about a $500 million infrastructure deficit, too. So it's roads and infrastructure, but the longer that we put it off in fixing them, the worse and more expensive it's going to be. Well, I, I think those are all nice ideas, but they're not functionally telling us anything. So what we need to do is have some kind of a plan. And one of the reasons why sales tax has been part of our legislative platform for so long is that I'm going to go, go into the, just the economics 101 here. When you have the general fund or our, property ta or our taxpayers paying for roads, what you do is you end up with what we call free riders. And free riders are the ones that use the roads but don't help pay for their maintenance. And in a tourist-based economy, we cannot let the free riders go. That means that our homeowners pick up that cost. So by instituting sales tax, much like six of the seven cities have done around the county, what we do is we capture the people who don't own property and we capture the people who don't live here and have them also contribute to solving the problem. That's why that's the right decision. It is protective of homeowners. And with regard to not prioritizing roads first, I'll tell you why we're not prioritizing roads first. Because right now, the County Board of Supervisors' attention is squarely on water, which is where it should be. And our 
resources right now, and I, our prioritized lists in planning and public works are all based around water, water infrastructure, and our interties, because we have got to deal with this crisis first, and that's why being able to, to prioritize those things equally isn't going to happen this year. God hope we get rain this year. But if not, that's why your board is working on this so hard right now. Thank you. This question will start with Ms. Ray. Mental illness and homelessness are major concerns in the South County. What do you plan to do to elevate this problem? I'll tell you what I've done and what I plan to do. So this is, everybody here knows that this is an issue and, and it's been uh, something that I've dealt with since I've been on City Council in Roy Grande. In fact, City Council was, of Roy Grande, was the first one to institute a safe parking program in the county. And that was a really tough leadership thing to do because there were a lot of, I'll call them NIMBYs, but not with disrespect, of really, they were afraid of a project like that. And we went ahead and took that on and took a leadership role here in the city of Roy Grande. Going forward up to the county level, we've done several things just this year since I've taken office. The first is the 51st program, which puts, or aims to put, the 50 most uh, chronic homeless people into shelter. And the reason we want to do this is because that will reduce the economic impact on the county. Another thing we've done is we've funded the 40 Prado project, which will hopefully be a new location for the Capslow program. We now just got two major grants, a $6 million grant to benefit homeless veterans in this county. And we've also just now, in this week, received a $1 million grant to help with homeless families. These are all programs that your Board of Supervisors are applying for or supporting in order to make a dent in this really, really important problem. Ms. Uh, there are two organizations that focus on South County, so I'll direct a little bit to South County. The Five Cities Homeless Coalition, the People's Kitchen, and as Ms. Ray mentioned, yes, they've just received two grants, one for rapid rehousing and the other for veteran services. So I think they're making progress in the right direction to getting these people help. Uh, they've started working with Good Sam, which is an organization in Santa Barbara County that's very successful. One of the things that I found very surprising when I was delving into this and asking people questions was we do not have a detox center in San Luis Obispo County, and that was very surprising to me. Uh, so I think they're looking at the possibility of doing that and working with organizations in Santa Maria that have been very successful with that. Um, when you look at the percentage of people living outside, this county has a very high percentage of people that live outside that are homeless, that are not sheltered. Uh, we need to work on that. The county had a 10-year plan to end homelessness. Homelessness. It started about seven years ago. We are in worse shape now than we were seven years ago when this plan started. So I think the board and the people are, um, that are involved with this are coming around to believing perhaps the approach we've taken in the past isn't necessarily the correct one, and I think they're on the right path to correcting the situation. It would be nice if we could find a place for the, home, the, the People's Kitchen in South County, and I'm committed to working to do that so people have a place to go where they need food. <coughs> Thank you. Ms. Compton, with you now, how do you feel about flooding in the Oceano? About? Flooding. Flooding in Oceano? Um, flooding in Oceano has been a problem over the years. I, I believe someone indicated that on Paul's first day of the job, we had the big flood a couple of years ago, um, and, and the levee was just completely flopped. The problem with flooding in Oceano is it takes so many different agencies to work with to just clean the reeds out of the gates there. It's something like 12 different organizations. You can't go in mechanically. You have to go in by hand, etc. So somebody has to be able to navigate those different routes to help them or they're going to have the situation again. Uh, with dry years, of course, we don't see it, but if we have a major flood again, you're probably going to see flooding. But there have been improvements made. There have been uh, changes made in areas where they've seen flooding. It's predominantly in two different areas in Oceano. So I think they're on the right path. And um, if we could just get someone that could navigate through all these different governmental agencies to allow you to go in and clean out some of these gates and clean some of these gates, I think that would lessen the problem substantially. Thank you. Well, I think that, that to piggyback on that and add to what we're really doing and how we solve this problem, we've had a project on the books in the Zone 11A watershed to be able to upgrade the levee that's in Zone 11A. And the agencies that Ms. Compton spoke about are mind-bogglingly uh, complex and difficult to get a hold of. We all know that. There's nothing that we can really do about that at the Board of Supervisors. Or can we? 
So what I decided to do was I did make, through my appointment process, a few contacts in Sacramento. So I traveled to Sacramento to make the argument with the appropriate people to try and see if I can't loosen those cogs and move them forward to get us through the regulatory process and get that Zone 11A levy fixed. We've got grant funding on the line right now, and that grant funding needs to be used by a certain date. I was successfully able to do that, so we got the state permitting out of the way, and now we're finally getting underway with the Army Corps of Engineers and getting those last pieces in place so that we can finally do the upgrades to the Roy Grandy Levy. That's how you get things done, rather than just complaining about regulatory structures that we don't have control over. Thank you. Next question is start with you. Do you support the relicensing of that volcano power plant, Ms. Absolutely. And the reason I support the relicensing is essentially, I mean, it's going to sound flip, but I don't mean it this way. It's not within the realm of the Board of Supervisors. So what I have to do as supervisors is I get to comment, I get to give my concerns, but I don't have any regulatory authority over the relicensing of Diablo Canyon. That's the NRC, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. So I support Diablo Canyon for two reasons. Number one, it's a bridge energy. It's one that provides energy, it provides jobs, and it pr provides huge economic impact to our county. But in the meantime, as it relicenses, of course we want to make sure that it is safe, it is well prepared, and it is prepared for what we know now, not for what we know then. The NRC will be the one that handles that project or that, that licensing, but again, we can be commenters on that, much like you would be commenters on an EIR. Thank you, Ms. Compton. Diablo Canyon is the number one economic engine in San Luis Obispo County. Its economic impact is $919 million. It pays $25 million in property taxes, which is equivalent to about 5,000 homes. I, for one, do not see, want to see anything happen to Diablo Canyon. But of course, safety is my first concern. And I, I too agree that the Board of Supervisors really has no say in relicensing it. The NRC does relicense it. But I think the Board of Supervisors should do everything in their power to uh, facilitate that the relicensing goes smoothly. Um, I don't think we should take a back seat. I think we should do everything to positively help that. There are different studies that are done. There are people that are <coughs> more educated than I am about that type of energy and what needs to be done, but I think we should do everything to support it. Um, it's jobs, it's clean jobs for those people that believe that a carbon footprint is um, something we want to avoid. This is your answer. It's clean energy, um, it's renewable energy, and I wholeheartedly support Diablo Canyon. Thank you. Ms. Compton, what is your view on medical marijuana dispensaries in this district? <laughs> medical marijuana dispensaries. Um, I would be the first to say I have friends and family members that have suffered from cancer and have used medical marijuana. I would not want to deprive anybody that's in pain from having this option if they wanted this option. Do I think we should have dispensaries on every corner of every street? No. Um, this came up a couple of years ago in Oceano and the people vehemently opposed it. My suggestion, rather than a medical dispensary, would be uh, through a pharmacy, a licensed pharmacist, if, if that's the route you want to take. Um, I don't think dispensaries on every corner is what we want to see, like we see in some other areas of California, especially in areas where you have a lot of families. So I don't want to deprive anybody the option of using that if they're <coughs> suffering. Um, I think it's more of the delivery and the manner in which we deliver it that is um, more of a bone of contention in Oceano as it has been and in the Pomo in the past. Thank you, Mr. I thought I'd anticipated every question that was coming today. <laughs> this one I was not ready for. Either. I thought I'd heard it all. You know, I, I think really what the key is, is there's a major difference between a mobile dispensary and a brick and mortar dispensary. So absolutely, this county seems to have said overwhelmingly they don't want brick and mortar uh, dispensaries. We've said that in Roy Grande as well. I'm unclear about what I want about mobile dispensaries. I can see both sides of that. And again, I wasn't prepared to answer this question. I haven't thought about this in a little while. But I do think that there's a possible way to get that licensed and allow people access to what they are by law allowed to have without creating the issues of a brick and mortar store and the sort of cultural 
things that might come with that. I'm choosing my words carefully there. So, you know, that's a little bit of an opaque answer. Um, I don't really know, but uh, as far as brick and mortar, absolutely not. Thank you. Ms. Ray, we'll start with you. Will the candidates continue to support the South County Advisory Council and its subcommittees, both politically and financially, as they exist under their present bylaws throughout the candidates' terms? Well, I'm glad I get to go first on this one, because this one was a big one when I took office. And my predecessor tried to dismantle the South County Advisory Council and the Oceano Advisory Council. And when that didn't work, he stopped funding those councils. And I, for me, that was not acceptable. So when I stepped into office, the first thing I did was began to repair those relationships. The SCAC and the OAC act for the Board of Supervisors kind of like a planning commission. They're not really a planning commission, but they're kind of like a planning commission. And having been a volunteer planning commissioner before, I know the value that that provides to the county. And so again, I stepped right in, restored the funding, Either myself or my assistant are at those meetings every single time. This is an important service, and yes, I will support them in any bylaws that they write, either current or future bylaws. Thank you. Oh, and I'll fund them as well. Ms. Company? I support them and fund them. I think, um, in my opinion, they should be elected positions and not appointed positions. When you have appointed positions, you get cronies in there. So I think the fair way is, is an elected position, and I have no problem with that. I, I am differing from Paul Teixeira on that opinion, but I think the fair way is to have it elected. Um, I would fund them and support them. Thank you. Ms. Compton, do you use slate mailers? Do you find them deceptive? Do I use slate mailers? For those of you that don't know what slate mailers are, slate mailers are little pieces of mail you get around election time um, that have five or six candidates on them. Yes, my campaign does use slate mailers. Slate mailers are a um, inexpensive, I guess you would say, way to get your name out. It's advertising. Um, I just got one in the mail yesterday from Governor Brown. They're very readily used by most candidates. Um, and the candidate does have control over what is said on. They, they don't put words into your own mouth. You have a, a sentence or two on every one of the slate mailers to say what you feel about a particular subject, and, and my campaign uses them. And um, that's the words that are used on them, so. You see? Well, uh, I did not use slate millers in the primary. I did not use slate millers in the general election. Absolutely, I find them deceptive and conf confusing for voters. That was made very, very clear in the uh, primary election, and I was very surprised to find that in the latest 460s uh, that Ms. Compton's campaign has spent $20,000 on slate mailers. So your mailboxes are going to be filled with these things, that, including the Democratic one, again. So this is a big deal. Because voters have a hard enough time trying to, be, to get informed. And it's my personal point of view that my job is to inform them truthfully and make sure that they are ready to be able to vote with all the information that they need. And those slate mailers are absolutely deceptive and confusing, and I will never purchase one. Thank you. Please stay in. Why don't we do this? Just show our appreciation to the ladies and to you for putting this together. Get out of your system. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Is that satisfactory? <laughs> you want to do it one more time? <laughs> no, we're done? Okay, let's go forward. This is why he's always MC, you know. That's right. <laughs> Thank you. What? Yay! What do you see as the role and benefits of solar energy in San Luis Obispo County? We we'll start with you, Ms. Okay. Yes. okay. Um, I didn't know this one was going to come up as its own uh, topic, so I'll just kind of talk about what we've done as solar energy here. Solar energy is the future, and it is the future of industry, and it is the future of business. It is an incredible growth industry, and San Luis Obispo County is fortunate to be at the epicenter of the solar industry. And in this county, we have almost 3,000 jobs that are connected to the solar industry. We have the largest photovoltaic uh, farm in North America. We have Berkshire Hathaway, 
Warren Buffett's group investing in San Luis Obispo County. This is absolutely an industry that I support, that I encourage, that I will use my supervisor's office to help, because this is where we build jobs in San Luis Obispo County for our future. Thank you, Ms. Compton. I don't have any problem with solar energy, but I think you're deceiving yourself if you think we can switch over to solar energy right like this. California uses 2 million barrels of oil a day. I don't think it's feasible or practical that we could completely switch over to solar energy at any time soon. Do I think it's good if we wean ourselves off of oil? Sure. Do I think it's good if we have alternative sources of energy? Sure. I don't think it's feasible to switch over. When you look at the feasibility of a lot of these solar farms, they're government subsidized solar farms. Would they be profitable on their own? Would they generate the electricity that they needed on their own? No, they wouldn't. So while I feel it's important as part of the overall mix, I think things like Diablo Canyon are more important to supplying our energy than all of our eggs in one basket with solar energy. Thank you. Ms. Compton, what percentage of your campaign funds came from the 4th District? Came from the 4th District. I, I just had my accountant figure out this morning what came from San Luis Obispo County, and it's 90%. I haven't figured it out for the 4th District, but I would assume it's probably close to half from the 4th District. Um, I've taken a lot of criticism for money that supposedly is out of state, and it's just not the case. 90% overall has come from San Luis County. Uh, the other 10%, probably the majority of that, has come from Santa Maria. We own a business that's uh, located in Santa Maria, but covers along the, covers the coast of California. Um, but 90% is from San Luis County. I would, I would guess probably close to half is from the 4th District, but I don't, I don't have that exact number today. Thank you, Ms. Ray. Well, strangely, I have the number for my opponent, but not for any other reason that somebody just published it um, and said that it was 33% from the 4th District. In mine, it's, in all honesty, probably darn close. I don't know what my number is as well. But I think it's important to mention that there is a huge number or amount of money coming from the North County into this campaign, and it's not coming to mind. And it goes back to the issue of water. And so it's not illegal. There's nothing wrong with that. It's that the North County wants that regulation of water and the water district that we fought so hard to get through the legislature to not succeed. And those people are funding my opponent's campaign. And it's very important to you to know where both of us stand and who in the water world is supporting both of us to give you an idea of what we're going to do about the water crisis, the number one thing, the number one issue that a supervisor is going to have to deal with when they become a supervisor. Thank you. Ms. Ray, what, what are your feelings about public art in the community and have you had any involvement? <laughs> Absolutely. I uh, wrote the first draft of the public art strategic plan for the city of San... Uh, San uh, God, look, I just got to remember Arroyo Grande. For the city of Arroyo Grande. Um, it was something that was a brainchild, and I have to give credit to Mayor Tony Ferrara, who uh, sat down with me over a glass of wine and said, would you continue consider taking this on? And so I wrote that, that plan, took that to the Community Development Department. The Community Development Department began to kind of unwrap that plan using another public plan that we had uh, uh, done as a template. And at that time, we started bringing in other people into the folds. We brought in Arroyo Grande and Bloom. We brought in some fabulous volunteers. And we were able to get that off the ground. And those volunteers have promoted, or have, have really pulled off miracles in this town. And we can only point to the, uh, the mural on the JJ's building as a perfect example of why we need to support public art here in the South County and all over the county. Uh, by the way. And I'll also tell you that I am no artist. I saw that thing on, uh, on a draft and went, oh, that's really big. <laughs> and I have to give really serious credit to those people on that committee who had that vision and who brought that to fruition and gave us something that is truly a landmark. We need to do that in Apomo. We need to do that in Oceano. So this is critical and absolutely I support it. I've been a part of it and I hope to do it at the county level as well. Thank you, Ms. Compton. Of course I support public art. I, I too am not an artist. I can barely draw a circle that looks even. So um, <laughs> I have to support it because I can't do it. 
Um, when you look at the person that's probably the most involved in, in Aurora Grandy here, it's a woman named Trudy Jarrett. She was sitting in the back. I don't know if she's here anymore. Trudy Jarrett has worked with my opponent. Trudy Jarrett has chosen to endorse me, and she's on my endorsement list. So I think that says a lot. But of course, who would not want to support public art in our communities, all of our communities? It's, it's a good thing for everybody involved. Thank you, Ms. Compton. What will you do to create more affordable housing? Well, I think there needs to be a balanced approach to affordable housing. There's a difference between affordable housing and workforce housing, which we briefly talked about today. But I think, as we talked about earlier, you need to zone more areas and let builders build economies of scale. When you look at, again, this county, very much of it is not developed. Only 4% is developed or soon to be developed. So we need to open some additional areas up and make it easier for builders to build bigger subdivisions so they can build economies of scale and that lowers the price. I think that's probably one of the most important things to do. I also look at and have talked to builders that build in the Center Valley and they build over here too. And the number one thing that they say is our county interprets guidelines so much more stringently over here than they do in the Central Valley. For example, CEQA guidelines. While that's not a county guideline, if we interpret it more difficulty, difficulty have more difficulty interpreting it here, it makes the builders jump through hoops to have to do things that they don't have to jump through in the Central Valley. So I think interpretation by the planning departments, et cetera, have a big impact on affordability of homes. We're limited with what we can do in this county. We're, we're bordered by an ocean on one side on mount, with mountains on the other side. So there's only a certain geography that we can work in, and I understand that. But homes are expensive because of a lot of government regulations. And when you look at the workforce housing study that the EBC did, the top four barriers to affordable housing were all government-controlled barriers. So we have to get those barriers out of the way if we want some more affordable housing. But I don't think it's a one-answer approach. I think it's multi-pronged. Thank you, Ms. Ray. I, I wish I had 60 minutes to answer this question because it's been a platform issue for me and it's really, really important. So I want to say first out, if I run out of time, please talk about it with me afterwards because I'm glad to talk for ad nauseum on this subject. Really, when we, I, I want to just talk about what my opponent just said because this is critical and it's a critical difference between us and you're all sitting here today trying to decide which person you're going to vote for. The reason that we interpret CEQA more stringently here in San Luis Obispo County is because we don't want to be the Central Valley. And we don't want this place to look like the Central Valley. And this is, thank you, this, this is a really critical difference between the two of us. I don't think we need to make it easier for builders to build, but we do have to make it more logical. It's also come up twice by my opponent that we need to zone for affordable housing. Affordable housing is not a zone. Affordable housing is a designation in our inclusionary housing element. So what we have to do is we have to make it so that our inclusionary housing element doesn't preclude uh, developers from giving us that kind of housing. And right now, the way the codes are written, it gets in the way. So I sit on a committee right now that is going through those codes line by line to make them more efficient so we can get more workforce and affordable housing. I hope I am still there next year to continue that work. Thank you, Ms. Ray. How is global warming affecting our county? Sorry, I was pulling on a new piece of paper. I was talking about it. Um, how is global warming affecting our county? Well, the question begins with, is global warming affecting anything? And I would say that it is, and I think it's important for us to deal with that. But on, on top of that, my philosophy maybe is less important than what we have to do. And as of AB 32, under, I almost said General, General Schwarzenegger, uh, <laughs> under the governor, under Governor Schwarzenegger, this is, this is landmark climate action legislation that was passed in 2006. And we are, whether we like it or not, whether we agree with climate change or not, we are mandated to make changes in order to prepare for climate change. And these changes are not bad changes. So the fact that I agree with them is nice, it makes my job easier, but it's a win-win across the board. It helps us build renewable energy sources. It helps us clean up our air. It helps us plan our roads better. There's no reason not to go down these, these, uh, these roads. Ha, ha, get it? And, <laughs> but it, at the same time, 
We don't, want, we don't want to harm businesses. So for example, through our APCD, we have new regulations that have to do with um, diesel converters to, to help with air quality. That's a statewide regulation. We have no, no help with that, but, or no ability to, to help with that. But we can help our local businesses by getting grants to be able to get the things they need to be able to comply with state regulations. That's how it all fits together. Thank you. Ms. Compton? Well, I think you have to look a lot of things when you look at global warming. First of all, we had predictions by Al Gore that in this year, 2014, the polar ice cap would be melted. It hasn't melted yet. Um, when you look at AB 32 and its implementation, it's hurting businesses. According to a Cal State economist, it's going to cost the California economy $182 billion to comply with AB 32. When I look at all the different plans that are being implemented by the different cities, let me give you an example of things that are being done. I attended the Paso Robles plan. What they want to do is to lower their carbon emissions. They want less people driving cars. Okay, I understand that. What they proposed was on the square in Paso Robles, let's lessen the parking places and parking spots around the square so people ride their bike in. So one person in the audience got up and said, okay, let me get this straight. You're telling us we're going to have less parking places and you think people are going to ride their bike to the square to go grocery shopping? It's not going to happen. Number two, what are they going to do? They're going to drive around in circles around that square until they can find a place to park. So it's fallacies like that that make me question if what we're doing is really what's good. When you look at all this cap and trade, I'm not sure how many people realize that 25% of the money that comes through cap and trade is going to the high speed train to nowhere. So I'm not opposed to policies that help our environment. My family and I breathe the air and want a healthy environment. I have a daughter with asthma. But when you punish businesses in California, when no other state is doing this, you're discriminating Thank against you, our Scotland. business people. Ms. Compton, I'm going to read this as is. And I'm allowed to ask two more questions, and then we'll give you the opportunity to do your closing remarks. Okay. In regards to the community involvement, prior to the campaign pre-June 13, what community serving have you been involved in? And after the elections, what would you do? Uh, community development. Let me just state that prior to this election, I was in law school for three and a half years, so I did not have a life for three and a half years prior to this election. I immediately uh, graduated from law school in Santa Barbara, uh, was studying to take the bar, and personal choice usually revolves around animal, animal issues and finding help for animals. Um, but volunteered for shelters my whole life, Santa, uh, Santa Maria, specifically in the most recent past. Yes, um, I'll just go, uh, you know, go through my list, my resume list, and kind of do it from bottom to top. So when I began my com community development or my community involvement, I was the founding coach for the girls' water polo team at Santa Maria High School. I coached swimming at Santa Maria High School for 10 years. I volunteered with Child Children's Resource Network. I'm a member of the Oklahoma Chamber of Commerce and the Aurora Grande Chamber of Commerce, although actually the question was prior to 2012. I was planning commissioner in Aurora Grande for, uh, for uh, five and a half years. I was chair of the Aurora Grande Planning Commission for three years. I've been the county, representative, or the county representative or city representative of Aurora Grande Tourism and Marketing Committee for the last few years. Uh, I am the county representative on the Commission on Aging. I've been a board member of the Economic Vitality Corporation for four years. And then the current ones I'll leave off here because that doesn't uh, answer the question. So really, and, and, and I, didn't leave, I didn't even write down the public art committee. So these were all things that I did prior to coming to office. Thank you. Next question, Ms. Ray. What water supply and demand solutions do you propose for District 4? Supply and demand. I think the biggest thing, and let's take them in, in backwards order. Let's start with demand, because that one's the harder one, and it's the more controversial one. With demand, we have to start looking at what water demand looks like. We have to start looking at meters. We have to start looking at, at monitoring what we're doing and collecting data so that we can better understand what our water situation is. Part of the problem with trying to manage water right now is we truly don't have the data. But that being said, we have to find a way to be able to do that especially via new state legislation that's coming down that's going to mandate us doing that in a way that, is, that preserves the privacy of both the personal and individual privacy of homeowners and the privacy of businesses, especially when their water use can become pri proprietary depending on what their, uh, what their business is. Um, on the, on the uh, supply side, there's a lot of talk about whether or not we should go for something like desal, and really we have to go a step 
first before we get there. We have to look at short, medium, and long-term issues. So, so the short term includes conservation issues and conservation ordinances that don't punish families who already are saving. That is a pledge that I make to you. Secondly, we need long-term solutions that include recycling and upgrading our plants, especially South County Sanitation District, which I have talked with Matt Guerrero with, etc. I've already talked to Katra with, because it's going to take multiple levels to be able to get that in place there. So we, we have to look at those recycling projects, and after that, we can be looking at desal. Thank you. Ms. Compton? I am not a believer that we can save our way to prosperity when it comes to the water situation. My concern is we're not going to get rain this year, and we're in a long-term drought, which could go 10 years or more. So I don't think we can get there by just cutting back on our water use. I think we need to look for alternate sources of water. And when we get rain, we need to store that rain in the groundwater. How do you store that rain? You use things called bladder dams. They're inflatable. You can put them uh, downstream so when it rains, instead of that water going out to the ocean, that water is trapped. You can deflate them when you don't need them. The water goes into the groundwater. In Arizona, they use things called spreading ponds, again, to trap the water. Our problem is we've used all our groundwater and depleted that, and we don't have that being replenished. Uh, in Arizona, they use things called injection wells. So when we have rain, we inject the water back into the aquifer. Um, I believe we should look at desail. I don't think it's something that Pomo can do, for example, by themselves. I think you need to look at all the coastal communities. When you look at the coastal communities of California, two-thirds of the people that live in California live along the coast. Why can't we get together and do some sort of facility? The largest desal facility is coming online in San Diego. It's called Poseidon in the next couple of years. It's been 20 years in the making, but we haven't done anything up till now. I think we need to do that. We're taking out dams. Two-thirds of the rainfall in California is in Northern California. We just took out two big dams on the Klamath River. Why are we taking out dams? We're taking out dams because of a lot of environmentalists that are opposed to that because of the fish. Thank you, Ms. Compton. Our last question for today, we'll start with Ms. Compton. Would you support the sale of the county-owned portion of the Oceano Dunes to the two states parks? Yes, I would support that. That's called the La Grande Track. Um, I don't know if that will ever happen. It's been negotiated off and on for several years. I think it's a liability to the county. Uh, state parks would like it. There have been figures that have gone, gone back and forth with regard to the price. Um, but I, I would support that. Yes, Maybe eventually, but at this time I would not support selling that because it is part of the leverage that we have to be able to protect our air quality here in San Luis County, and I do not want to let go of that leverage until we've solved that problem. Thank you. Well, let's hear it from all of you for the